Good evening, blessed be. It's kind of late for me, so I'm a little tired, but I do want to get this lecture done tonight if I can, so here we go. Let's give this a shot. This is Wicca and Witchcraft 101, Lecture 2. We are focusing on mind-altering meditation and circle casting. I will warn you now, in the middle of this lecture, there is a guided meditation that will take um, like 10 to 15 minutes and you really shouldn't be interrupted. It can be dangerous to be interrupted. It can make you feel out of sorts for a few days if you come out of that meditation kind of quickly from the deeper stages. So <clears throat> you probably should do that portion of it um, when you're not distracted. get started. First of all, I went through everyone's homework, and I'm really proud of you guys. The homework is really good. We're going to talk a little bit more about dedication statements. Um, actually, maybe I just want to start off talking about that. So, the dedication statements are really good. We have an amazing variety of statements. So, we have a bunch that are kind of Wiccan. We have one that's really Gardnerian, we have a bunch that are kind of eclectic, and then we have some that are just like a-religious almost. And I think that's really cool. A lot of people are trying to use common phrasing, um, but they're using it in kind of different ways than you would expect. An example here that I can think of is um, in perfect love and perfect trust, I see people using variations of that, which is kind of cool. You can feel free to use a variation. A lot of times people prefer to use the, uh, oh, I hope that's not messing up the mic too much. It's, sorry. A lot of people prefer to use the actual um, exact phrasing because they like the tradition of it. So um, just so you know, the exact phrasing is in perfect love and perfect trust. Um, comes from a poem. I have a bunch of um, phrasing examples in my book of shadows. I should have marked it. states very clearly uh, what they're dedicating to. Um, it's very obvious that you all took it very seriously and that you all have something, a goal in mind, which is really good. Okay, um, so generally good, good there. Um, I gave these examples of ritual phrasing in the Wicca 101 series, which I don't think everyone has seen. So I'm just going to do it formally here. Um, this is from my book, Shadows. I just have a page with like random just examples like this so that I can easily um, get some motivation for what to write later. Some of them are things like Guardians of the North, Spirits uh, of the Earth, we ask your presence to guard our right and bring presence to our circle. Be welcomed in peace. Blessed be. That's one example where you're invoking one of the elements, but you could invoke anything like that, really. But, um, there's one, Mighty Ones of the East. We thank you for your attendance uh, at our right. As you depart, we bid you hail and farewell. So that's like, this is like really standard. If you go to a circle that's like open to the public and anyone can go, this is like what they say in these kinds of circles. Like very standard. Um, for some invocations, we have things like, Lord and Lady, we call unto thee. Come to us now and set our minds free. Come, our horned king and blessed queen, and with you we'll make magic in the worlds between. 
Um, or another one is, we will give to you honor and worship to, you'll give to us and we'll give to you a relationship with that which either could be, dear Lord and Lady, we call unto thee. So you can see that these things are like, they, all, they mostly rhyme, a simple language. Um, if you're doing like a dedication, it's almost like an invocation plus a bit. So um, you could use similar phrasing to this. Um, you know, it doesn't have to rhyme though. Um, but these are just some examples uh, of the way that things are often phrased. I wish I had one that had the actual sun, wind, land, and sea, release all that's bad for me, banish this negativity, as I do will, so mote it be. Um, notice the syllables. Uh, the syllables are important because you want these to be chantable, things that are like, that you can really just kind of spit out, you know? so. Uh, you know, sun, wind, land, and sea, release all, that's bad for me, banish this negativity, as I do will, so mote it be. It's like the same number of syllables, and the where you put the stress kind of changes every time, so it's like this interesting, like, chant bit. So, um, these are the kinds of things that people, um, think of when they think of like inc invocations or incantations or, um, <clears throat> spells because they're easy to remember, they're easy to chant, and chanting is one way to get into an altered state of mind. So, that segues us into this, uh, lecture and, um, here we're going to talk about how to get into an altered state of mind, why it's important, and then I'll talk about your homework for this week, which will involve finalizing the dedication statements, um, and then I hope you will take the time to do your dedication. Um, look at saw coming up on the, on the 1st of August. Um, yeah, okay. So, let's get started. The concept of altering one's mind <clears throat> for spiritual practice, uh, let me just grab a, a drink real quick. Let me see. <clears throat> Much better. So the concept of altering one's mind is very old, um, it's shamanic, that means that it dates back to when um, pre-migratory tribes lived in northeastern Asia, um, they spoke the Avenki language, I don't know that language, I'm not that familiar with that language tree in general, but uh, what I do know about shamanism is that it involved natural practices, um, natural healing, um, your basic wise man, wise woman type type of thing. Oh, this is like so hot. So um, the key to um, having spiritual experiences in the shamanic practices is to have an altered state of consciousness. And the shamans, those were people who either did light or dark magic, but they practiced magic and they worshiped the gods. Um, they would use tools, they would use self-inflicted pain and drugs to get into all states of mind. Um, th these practices Basically, they believed that they allowed awareness of other non-physical planes, um, places where spirits and deities lived. The concept of the spirit world was very big. You see it a lot in Eastern culture, and that all has the same, and you see it a lot in Native American culture, and that actually all has the same roots, the same um, Evenki uh, sh shamanism that, that got migrated out to all these different places. And evolved to be different in many ways and similar in many others. Um, today, 
Shamanism primarily uses tools like drums, um, rattles, or reflective objects, um, and it uses music and chants. Um, they'll combine this with incense and dim lighting, and they'll try to ca cause what's called an awareness shift, where you don't realize it, but now you're in a different state of mind. It's supposed to be a um, kind of a passive thing that um, helps you... Um, you know, basically exert less effort to get to the deeper states of consciousness so you can maintain the meditations for longer periods of time. Um, they'll try to overwhelm the senses to force the shift, and that's why they'll use, like, drugs and incense and rattles and stuff like that. Um, the kinds of drugs that you can use, you use peyote, that is cactus. Um, that is really Native American shamanism. You can use uh, mushrooms, uh, cannabis, and what's called flying ointment, which works the same way that nicotine would, but it is basically an ointment, and it's actually, uh, this is where the broom myth ties into all this, is that um, witches would take this ointment and they would uh, like rub it inside of themselves, and then hop around in a broom around the circle to cast it during the uh, harvest holidays, during the dead days, because the broom was purifying and it um, symbolized um, <clears throat> cycles and um, <clears throat> purification of energy uh, and then fertility in the season, in the spring to come. So, um, <clears throat> so the broom is a very mutable tool. So in the fall, they would put this ointment up their cooches and hop around on these brooms. And the uh, ointment was called flying ointment, and it would make them feel like, ooh, like they're flying. So that is where the broom flying myth comes from, completely from this flying ointment, which works essentially the same way in your brain that uh, nicotine does. So it's just a different way of doing that. Uh, tobacco probably should be on this list, actually, because that is very key in a lot of shamanistic practices. Tobacco, they'll um, pass around a cigar before they do ritual. The key, the key with drugs is don't use too much of it. Um, I personally don't even really like to do drugs during or before ritual. Um, to me, it's like, I like fasting. I like, I like fasting. Um, I like just going all day, meditating and hanging out and cooking a bunch of food and just chilling, maybe drinking some, some wine and then doing ritual. And then after ritual, that's when like you'll have a party and you can smoke or, you know, hang out, whatever you want to do. So I think personally that drugs really can distract from the purpose of the ritual and oftentimes it's easy to um, do to have too much fun and to lose sight of what you're doing. Now, a lot of people say though that mushrooms and peyote give them magical experiences that they otherwise wouldn't have had. So I feel like you could have all of these things just through meditation. Also, um, I experienced most of these crazy things before I ever used any drugs um, back when I was younger. So I have confidence that you don't need drugs to experience these altered states, but you could use drugs if that was your thing. Um, I, th I think, you know, it can be a distraction too. So you just have to decide if that works for you or not. Um, there's a lot of tribes out there though that people will go and pay money and stay with them and that like donate money to stay with them and they'll take peyote and and have shamanistic trips and I want to deposit this point actually and um, how do I and switch over to play some drumming as an example let me turn this off
So you can easily see how this drumming um, can alter the state of mind. I mean, it's pretty powerful stuff. It altered my state of mind just, you know, in the 30 seconds we're sitting here. So powerful tools like drums and those kinds of things, um, incense. Yeah, you don't you don't need drugs. Drugs are just one option. So um, let's talk about the liver renewal assignment. So liver renewal is like super crazy. Okay, let me get a little more tea. <clears throat> okay, so as you all know now that you read liver renewal because I know you did read it. Liber Newell is crazy. <laughs> um, it's very concise, and it's like, if you don't do this, then you suck, and you're never going to do magic. And it's like kind of mean in the way it's raised. But it is a good description of how to do magic. And it breaks everything down really well. And I think it's good to get this perspective. But I went ahead, and I broke it down again here. And I divided it into levels. And I want to talk about how you could do each of these techniques and why you should do some of these techniques. Some of you are beyond the beginner stage already, and that's fine. I would still recommend doing these beginner meditations, though, this coming week, because I think, I mean, just like one, pick one beginner. I think it's important to practice the very fundamentals on their own, you know, just to ensure that you really are, like, using good form, if you will, you know, so... The beginner uh, meditations are motionlessness and breathing. Motionlessness is just as it sounds, you lie still in what's called um, the dead or the corpse position in yoga. And you can have your palms facing up or you can have your palms facing down. You just lay on the floor, just going to lay or sit perfectly still and you're just going to concentrate only on sensing yourself your physical form, where your barrier is. You may want to twitch your fingers a little like while they're resting. Um, like that may want to happen intrinsically. So just allow yourself to move and feel and be. So that's motionlessness and the purpose of it is to help one gain the ability to sense your position in space and time. Because you are feeling the energy around you and you are just being and that almost takes you outside of time and your awareness is much vaster than that and you can just sit for a moment and consider the vastness of a, a world outside of time and that kind of uh, helps you hone in on you know how to navigate the whole space-time cosmos that is on these higher planes of existence that is something that you're aware of, how to navigate that awareness, because even the awareness is so vast that it's like you, you need a system to control your own personal awareness of it, you know. Um, so then breathing is really to help you develop focus and the idea is to let your tummy muscles out relax you should not be breathing like don't go like that you should your shoulders should stay relaxed and you should just allow your tummy to fill up allow your diaphragm to open or to rise and fall you know just natural easy breaths and the idea is to focus only on the breathing and it helps you feel your connection to the surrounding world because as you breathe in and out, your energy pulses in and out as well and interacts with the world around you. So it helps you focus better and it helps you connect to the world around you. So motionlessness prepares you to navigate unseen planes of a higher vibration and breathing is what allows you to stay connected to this plane of existence. This is why both of them are important fundamentals that I suggest you do practice on their own. I still do these things. It's fun. 
it doesn't have to be for long. Even if you just do one of these, like say a song comes on the radio and you're lying down and you just like, you know, whatever, you're at a party, maybe you're you're sobering, you, you were drunk, you're sobering up, you're laying down, you feel good, song comes on. Maybe you just do motionless meditation and you just pretend to be asleep and you just meditate for like the duration of a song or two. Like, I've done that. And it's fine. And people just think you're sleeping and then you wake up and you keep partying and it's fun. But it's like, you can like totally cleanse yourself and, and clear your mind and, you know, find out why you're so happy in that moment and realize, you know, realize things about yourself and about the universe and about life. So take any opportunity you have to meditate and to come to know yourself. And these are the two meditations that help you really come to know yourself. Your mind and your physical body right here, broken down. Okay, so next we have the first intermediate, not thinking. It's an intermediate because many people think too much. And that's a chronic problem. I do myself, so I understand. Um, the idea is that you get to a state of motionlessness where you're controlling your breath at once, okay? And that completely focuses your mind. And you can imagine like something like a candle in your mind, like a flame, and it's flickering, and everything is going into the flame or being absorbed by the flame, being burned up until there's nothing, and then it's just a void. A hot, smoky void, I guess, because there was a burning fire in it. <laughs> um, you might result in hearing. It's not really hearing, but it'll kind of feel like hearing because your brain is trying to convert it to something that makes sense to your five senses. But it's more like a feeling, and you just get this kind of like sensation of, of hearing your subconscious, and it's just like a murmur. It's like, you can't pick out anything. It's just like things being whispered, okay? Uh, you can't really turn it off. It's things like heartbeat, 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 uh, and uh, we need nutrients over here and like signals your brain is controlling that have absolutely nothing to do with anything significant, like just the functioning of your body. Now, it's, of course, it's significant. Like, oh, nothing significant. It's just the functioning of your body. Like, obviously, that's significant. So, you know, and you can't turn it off because those need to be going all the time. So the best you can do is just listen to the murmur. And sometimes, though, the murmur helps knowing that the murmur is there helps you because static is often easier to focus on than nothing. Um, and this, this is really called mental motionlessness, okay? You're in a state of being physically, mentally, and spiritually. Just being all at once. Intermediate. Okay, the next intermediate is sound, sight, or image concentration. Um, this is focusing on something... Um, so strongly that everything else seems totally insignificant, um, or tuning into something, um, letting your eyes unfocus and then looking at something so that you could see a pattern with your mind's eye. Um, you know, that would be like crystal balls or, or fire or wax scrying. Um, oh, meditation is sound concentration where you're just like, and the objective is just to tune with the universe, with the room around you, with your existence. You're trying to be in tune, so you're, and you do different notes. Um, image concentration is like small things though in this case like a square uh, or like imagining a, a box and you can open the box and there's things inside that you need for ritual you have like a ring and you put the ring on um you could do image concentration visualization kind of on small scales like you're not really affecting energy uh around you with this kind of visualization this is just affecting your own internal workings. That's image concentration. Usually it'd be like, if you're just like meditating and you're focusing on a sphere and you imagine a sphere and then you 
and first it's just a white circle, but then you get closer and you realize it's a smooth sphere and you can see the lighting and the shadow and it gets more and more detailed, you know, the closer you get to it. So, um, yeah. Okay, advanced magical trances. This is the level that you should all be at by the time we get to invocation in this course. We're going to practice trances using evocations for the next three weeks or so and then we're going to move on to invocations and you should all be able to do this level at that time. To give you some perspective. We're going to be moving quick. Magical trances are required for rituals and invocations. Uh, they're basically required for effective evocations as well but many people don't realize this and um, this is why you get a lot of kooks, people who uh, don't realize they're not really doing magic, they're just getting lucky. Um, magic is a specific thing that you can sense and feel, and I'm going to talk about that later. Um, but for now, just know that you basically need to be in this kind of trance. Um, magical trance is where your mind and your body are quiet and there's nothing in your mind mental and physical motionlessness well, you don't even need to be physically motionless you just need to be at a point where your conscious mind is insignificant and there's no influence from your subconscious in your in your subconscious from your conscious mind there's no influence uh, it's just you acting uh, in accordance with some procedure that you had written out and planned at an er, in earlier time. Uh, and the reasons, the, and this ties into the reasons why magical workings fail. So why would a spell fail? You do a spell, you pick the flowers on the full moon and you steep it and you do all this hard work and then it doesn't work. Why might it not work? Distractions. <laughs> so, um, egotistical identification is listed in the book that would be like your awareness of self okay fear of failure that is self-doubt and reciprocal desire not to achieve desire would be acceptance of self so if you're aware of your desire for it and you think that you deserve to have it even without having to do this working then the working may fail because you're in your mind you're thinking this working is not necessary. So you, you need to be aware of yourself enough that you can put yourself completely aside when you're doing magic and just do magic as if you didn't have self. Um, you know, the procedures of the ritual should be laid out such that you don't need to have desire to complete the ritual. The desire is the ritual itself. You know, you, you kind of have to check your emotions and your your physical feelings at the door when you're doing ritual because you're trying to invoke energy that is far, far greater than yours and work with that. So, um, you know, the emotions should already be set. You should ground and center and put yourself in the right state, the right feeling when you go into the circle. The whole tone of the circle should be the emotion. Everything decorated the way it should be. You shouldn't have to think about how you feel or what you want. It's a feeling. It's a concept. It's something that just is inside of you. And that's what I'm really talking about here. Uh, if you start thinking about what it is you want consciously and, and you are not truly feeling it, then the magic is not going to work. Uh, fear, fear of failure is obvious why that would affect you and this is why you know when someone's like trying to quiz you and you're just like ah, I can't do this because you get so stressed out and you start second guessing yourself and losing confidence and it's like it makes you panic. If you have fear of, self, of failure you are not going to succeed in doing magic and it's so hard to put that aside when people are like quizzing you. So my recommendation as a beginner is just not to do magic or engage with people who don't believe in magic as a beginner. Once you get more confident doing magic, 
then you can start to prove it to people by doing their star charts and explaining what magic is and singing for them and casting circle when you're hanging out. And people would really start to understand what you mean by magic and good vibes. Um, it just, it's, it's a slow thing. <laughs> so don't worry about failure for now. Avoid people who think you are a failure because you believe in magic and just focus on um, learning how to believe in yourself. So the third reason it fails is the reciprocal desire not to achieve the desire that you're you know, set upon, for instance, if secretly you're totally okay with your life right now and you know you don't really want to get a new job because that means a lot of work and new training but you do really want to make more money so you know there's conflicting emotions and if there's a part of you that accepts yourself right now um, then it's possible that you'll fail the working because you just don't want to change and that can be a good thing or it could be a bad thing and so it's important again to kind of like leave yourself aside and let the emotion and physical desires mend or sorry mold into or, or melt into the spiritual um, essence that you invoke in the circle and then the magic component is having the will to direct that uh, even though you're not in a conscious state of mind um, so you must be able to keep your consciousness quiet for the workings to be successful lest one of these plague you and ruin your working. Um, and this is why you have to focus on meaningless phenomena. If you focus on meaningless phenomena, things that don't, that don't force you to think at all, nothing that causes you to think, then um, you, know, you won't be conscious. And this is where the concept of visualization comes in. So you visualize energy moving because you don't want to think about anything but the energy moving. So the visualization is like a way of distracting yourself so that you can actually do the working and not, you know, fail it because you have some awareness of what you're trying to do. Um, and this is why when people say, well, visualization is basically just like your imagination. It's like deluding yourself. It's like, well, yeah, it is deluding yourself. But why should that mean you're not doing also doing something effective? So, um, and that's, you know, that's really cool, I think, that visualization fits in like that. And that's why I embrace visualization, because for a long time it was really hard for me. And I didn't think I really needed it, but I'm glad I embraced it, because it's really good. The final one in here is metamorphosis. This one's a little crazy. Um, we'll just talk about it a bit. So the idea is that you can change yourself uh, very easily if you just put yourself into a state of mind, um, you know, similar to a trance, and you just say, uh, "I am going to, um, you know, stop some technique today that I, some habit, some way of doing something." that I've done for a few years, I'm just going to do it differently today. I'm just going to part my hair on the other side. You know, I'm just going to drive a different way to work. Whatever the case may be. Um, and you just change your habits. And if you do that enough, you slowly realize that the person that you are is basically defined by your habits. And becoming a different person is as simple as wanting new habits. And for exam example, if you want to be thin, but you don't want to have the habit of running or working out, then you don't really want to be thin. You um, don't want to have a lifestyle of a thin person. So you would be happier and closer to your true self if you just accepted the fact that you didn't want to be thin, as opposed to getting depressed about how you want to be thin, but you can't because you don't want to live like a thin person, right? So um, it, it's like a way of, pers uh, of putting perspective to the idea that um, you can be whoever you want to be based on your own choices, free will. And, um, you know, you'll be enlightened, you'll be at your true state, your happiest state of being, when you can at any time act in accordance with your truest desires. And it is easy 
and you don't need to consciously think about it. It is a habit for you to do that which is good for you, and that which brings you joy, and you are in an optimal state of being then, and that would be enlightenment. To me, in this state, you must be prepared to laugh, and you must be prepared to detach yourself from your perception of reality. So it's very tricky what this is saying in the book, but this is what this is saying. This wants you to be able to be calm at a moment's notice and to be prepared to consider the situation you're in as if you were not the observer, as if you were every observer, or as if there was no observer, which doesn't even make sense. Uh, but it's kind of like when you're in a dream and you're not sure if you're watching yourself or if you are... Um, what, if you are, if the camera is like from you outward or what, so. Um, so metamorphosis is a tool for turning yourself into an enlightened being. It's very, very advanced. Uh, this one you probably would not master until second degree. So this is like a, as advanced as it goes. So uh, don't worry about this one for now, but if you have questions about what it means, then let me know because I want you to at least understand what it means. Okay, so now we're going to do a guided meditation. I'm really excited about doing this. Um, I, where did I put my phone? I'm, I need to find my phone because Okay, well, I found my phone. I want this just so that I can remember exactly um, how I want to do this. But we're going to do a guided meditation. The goal of this meditation is to reach an altered state, a deep altered state that we'll then talk about afterwards. And I want you to try to just come to feel your own self, your own energy. Um, and feel free to repeat this guided meditation if you really like it. Okay. So, close your eyes. Let me turn off this music. Okay, this is what we need. Can you tell I went to the beach this week? Because this is a beach-inspired meditation. Okay. Close your eyes and take deep breaths. In and out. In and out. Turn my phone back. In and out. In and out. And you can imagine yourself standing on a beach and every breath in and out is like the wind blowing, the breeze blowing gently, salt, salty seawater splashing your face as the wind blows and you breathe in and out. You walk across the sand and into the water, and it's cold, it's cool, but it's not too cold. It feels good. And you walk further into the water, and you take a deep breath in, and you dive under the water. And it's cold, and it sends a ripple of cold. And then it feels good. And you realize that you can breathe in and out. In and out. And you look around and you swim this way and that way in the cool water. And then you notice beneath you, 
down in the murky depths, a light shining in the distance. So you start to swim down and it gets darker and cooler, but the light gets bigger and brighter and you keep swimming, swimming and deep into the murky waters and the light is all surrounding you and it's warm now and you can't tell if it's so warm it's cool or so cool it's warm and you just breathe in the light and it goes out around you like a breeze through the water as you breathe in and out in and out and you feel inside of you like an electric charge as the light grows brighter and brighter warmer and bursts outward a ways through the water and then starts to dim and you feel yourself becoming lighter as you float up toward the surface and you look for the natural light above you and you swim up and your head breaks through and you can hear the waves crashing against the shore so you swim over and step out onto the sand and feel the breeze blowing in and down and in and out slowly as the image fades open your eyes and you feel ready So I hope that worked for you guys. I did this meditation and I really liked it and I'm kind of new to doing guided meditation. So I hope that was good. You can give me feedback if you want. Um, but the idea is that it just helps you feel one with yourself. It helps you feel like you can dig deeper into your subconscious. And the idea is that you get to that state where you're standing in the light and you just be. And when you come out of it, you have a greater awareness and appreciation of your inner self. So I hope you enjoyed it and feel free to do it on your own or to do it again with the recording, whatever floats your boat or helps you swim to the bottom of the ocean, you know. <laughs> okay, so for the rest of the lecture, we're going to talk about actually manipulating energy. And um, that starts with sensing it. So um, I have a quote here, believe in the possibility of what you intend to do, hold it strongly in your mind and it will happen. That is from Liver Newell and he is, no, 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 that is from Doreen Valiant's uh, Natural Magic, another one of the required readings. We will wind up reading all of Natural Magic, um, so I hope you enjoy it, um, but we're going to do it. Um, as it aligns with what we're talking about in the course. So if you want to read ahead, go go on. If you're going to call yourself a witch and you're going to be Wiccan, you should probably own a copy of Natural Magic by Doreen Valiant. It's like the most Wiccan book ever. Um, but you could also just use the PDF. But we are going to wind up reading that whole book. So if you're going to buy one of the books, that's the one I would buy. Okay, so 
the idea of this is, you know, and, and I call it the Polar Express example because I'll, I'll explain that. If you believe in something strongly enough, then it becomes real. And the idea behind this can be found in the Polar Express where in the beginning, the kid doesn't hear the bells ringing. He gets to the um, Santa Claus's North Pole and the bells are not making any noise. And it's because at the start of the movie, it showed that he was too old to believe in Santa. And this was, and he got picked up by the Polar Express. And he goes on this crazy adventure, and by the time he's done, he can hear the bells ringing. And he comes back, and he picks up the bell that's wrapped under the tree. And it rings, and it sounds beautiful. And his parents say, oh, we're, we're sorry your bell doesn't work, like because they can't hear it, and he can hear it, and his sister can hear it. So why can they hear it and his parents can't? Well, it's because they believe the bell makes a noise. So whether or not you um, believe in something changes the way you perceive the world around you. Uh, and that's significant because um, people don't really understand the level of um, perception that the human awareness is capable of. and things like the imagination and, um, you know, pulling things into this reality from other realities is, is a real concept. And I explain these concepts in detail in the Metaphysics live video series. I think I will eventually do a Metaphysics lecture series on here um, because it's really cool and it's really important, but that is a lot harder. So I'm just going to kind of touch on this. You see a picture of a string here. I'm going to give the fastest um, version of string theory and quantum gravity that you've ever heard. Um, the idea is that energy is all around us. Um, everything on its most fundamental level is just energy. And um, the way that energy vibrates determines what kind of particle it is. And what kind of particle it is determines what forces it interacts with. Um, and what forces it interacts with determines the whole structure of the universe. And based on the physical laws of our universe, there are a certain set of timelines that are possible and impossible. And an example of an impossible timeline is, you know, so zombies are not possible in our universe. Like the concept of someone who's alive and dead and you know, ripping off an arm isn't going to slow them down. It's like, you know, it's, it's, we, it really can't happen. That's just not how, bio, not how biology works. So somebody took that idea from another reality where that's possible, a totally separate universe with different physical laws, and they made it real in our universe just by imagining it. But it's still impossible, but it's real here. So, you know, the idea is, you know, if you believe in zombies and you find yourself being chased by zombies and, and you know, you wind up hurting yourself in the process, does it matter if those zombies existed or not? Because the outcome is the same. You got hurt. You know, so the idea is that the human perception is really in a greater number of dimensions than you would think. And that's where you get things like imagination and the ability to visualize and the ability to perceive their timelines from. And that is the basis of our ability to kind of do magic is to perceive the universe in 10 dimensions. Even though we experience it in four, we can kind of see it in a higher number of dimensions. And that gives us the perspective we need to be able to manipulate it in very fine ways. And that is what the art of witchcraft really is. And that's really why we're here. So how to sense energy, some basic techniques, okay? Um, you want to use some of the meditation examples I already gave to alter your state of mind first. Then you could do something like allow the boundary between yourself and the world around you to vanish. You could imagine you being light, maybe the color of your aura. You can imagine the world around you being light. You could imagine things being different colors based on the kinds of materials that make them up. Um, you could imagine everything being like static and you're like floating in static. Um, that's one of my personal favorites. 
Um, and all of these are ways to just like help you get to that state of non-thinking, which is critical for magic. You could listen to music that moves you. You could listen to it really loudly. You could dance to it if, if it feels natural. Some people said, I don't know, I, I stood up and started dancing. I don't know if that's right. It's totally right. Dancing is super shamanistic. Remember at the beginning how I said they would dance and play the drum and and you know, and it's ecstatic. They would dance ecstatically. So that is super witchy. So dancing. Um, you could focus on a sensation that you get when something miraculous happens. That shortness of breath or goosebumps when you're like, oh my god, I can't believe that just happened, or oh my god, I can't believe that just didn't happen. Like I thought I was about to die or something, you know. That sensation that you get is something that you could that you could focus on enough that you put yourself into an altered state of mind. Um, you could uh, meditate with crystals. You could pick ones that you know the type of them, but not the effects, and you could write down what you think the effects are based on how it feels, and then you could ch check yourself, and that's a way to learn uh, how to sense the energy of the crystal. Um, or you could imagine a ball of light or sparks going between your palms. You can imagine a ball of light, and you can imagine like rolling it around, tossing it up. You can imagine juggling balls of light, you know, whatever you want to do, that's a form of visualization people often use to get started as well. Once you get into some of the more complicated techniques, um, you know, so imagination is not as imaginary as you think. Um, you know, just the act of visualizing something and seeing something that's not really there in your mind's eye uh, is enough for you to um, uh, you know, change your your state of mind. You can just kind of force yourself into a state where you perceive of multiple kind of realities all at once, and maybe it's not clear which is the real one and which isn't. Uh, and so when you take the imagination and you combine it with the willpower to direct this, uh, that that's when you can really create and direct energy um, and affect change in the world around you. So imagination, you know, is the act of making things real in this reality, like I said. Uh, even if it's still impossible, it's real. Um, and this is what quantum gravity tells us, that every possible universe that could happen is happening, that every timeline that could happen is happening, and it's all happening right here, right now. These higher planes of existence aren't like off in some place in space. They are our plane, they are us, okay? We're talking deities are the forces that make up our world. The force of life, the force of death, that would be like Jesus and Satan or whatever dichotomy of good and evil. The force of femininity, the force of masculinity, these would be, again, broken down then into more forces like aggression and, um, um, you know, uh, strength, um, then you have nurturing uh, and, um, and, you know, giving. So you have like Tai Chi versus Karate. So you have um, these dichotomies. And these, are, these forces uh, break down into the forces that govern our universe. And it, it's like a way of expressing the universe in terms of forces, not scientific forces, which are equally valid, but uh, metaphysical forces that describe the spiritual workings of the universe as well. The original science, philosophy is the original science. Uh, so then uh, bubble casting is the most complicated technique for manipulating energy on its own, and we're going to cover that next week when we talk about chakras. Please ask questions if any of this went over your head or didn't make any sense. I bring up the science because a lot of people are like, oh, I'm just deluding myself, and it's it's different than that. Um, but obviously, I, I can't get to all of the science in one hour-long video. It's just too much. So. Okay, so to awaken your third eye, to help you able to see the world around you and perceive of higher dimensions and stuff, um, you could do astral meditation. The idea is that you pull your awareness out of your body um, into the realm of space. You understand the vastness of space time scales, um, mortal affairs become insignificant, pain, bugs bothering you, heat, things like that, hunger, they don't bother you because you are um, 
on the plane of space, but you're still anchored to your body. I do recommend casting a circle using a sigil so that you don't have to actually cast it while you're doing this. Um, you know, if, if you're nervous about running into beings and being able to protect yourself on these other planes, then just cast a circle or do a protective sigil. Um, but it's a form of meditation. It's very useful. I recommend doing it, um, you know, at least like once a week probably. Um, you could use it for pain management because, again, it puts yourself into a, like you're off in la la land, so you can't feel pain if you wanted to. Uh, it's really good for divination and for healing. And Val went ahead and wrote a whole research paper on it, um, and that's up on our website, so check out that link. There's a tea recipe here that you could do. You could replace any of these things uh, or, or remove things if you can't find them and just make it with less ingredients. Um, and then there's a bunch, of, a bunch of crystals here that help. Notice the colors, right? Because like next week we'll talk about the chakras, but they're all blue, um, purple, and white, right? Higher chakras. So we'll talk about that more next week. Okay, so this is a, a really interesting one. How do you know if your magic is working? <laughs> so everyone always asks this question. They're like, how do I know if I'm really doing magic or if I'm just delusional? So delusion is when you believe something is happening that is not happening. How do you know if something is actually happening normally? Like how do you know if you're actually on a roller coaster versus you're watching a roller coaster on television? the wind, the feeling in your stomach. There's physical sensations that go along with emotional sensations that make it into a spiritual experience, right? And, and the magic is like the vehicle for this, for combining these ingredients. Same thing with, with, in this case, okay? Your body has a physical sensation when you're doing magic. It might feel like your muscles are burning, uh, kind of in a pleasant way, like a soft burn. And it's not like burning, like working out. It's like, it's not like burning like pins and needles. It's totally different than any other kind of feeling. It's, it's different. Uh, you might get goosebumps on the skin or your hair may stand up on end. <clears throat> the air around you might feel electric like it does like when a storm is about to come in and you can like feel it's going to be a big storm and there's like lightning striking the ground near you and stuff. That electric feeling is something that should be in the air if someone is doing magic. So that's how you can feel other people's magic as well, is, is you'll get these same symptoms no matter who is doing the magic if you're in circle with them. Uh, if you have a circle cast and they're not in your circle, obviously you're not necessarily going to feel it. Um, so magical prowess is when you are doing the visualizations and you're moving the energies and you're also feeling it work. And if there's any question in your mind, did this work, then it didn't work basically, because you will know if it's real magic and if it's really working. And if you don't know that it's working and you just think it is, then you're at risk for deluding yourself. Because if you just think it worked and then you convince yourself that it worked over time by thinking it enough, what if it didn't work? And what if like, you know, so you don't want to go down that path. Either you, either you know it and it worked or you don't know it and it didn't and you should do it again. Okay, that's like, I had to do cleansings and stuff multiple times because I didn't feel it. It didn't work. So I just did it again. You know, it happens. Okay, so this video is going to probably run long here. I'm sorry about that, but we've got to cover circle casting. This is the same slide from the first one, but I added a new picture. So the fun little catchphrase, trace the circle thrice about to keep the evil spirits out. It's like, you know. And the idea of the circle is to contain energy. Uh, different kinds of circles are used for different things. In this picture, you see a bunch of different kinds of circles. So you see the traditional nine-foot circle here that has the, um, the pagan star in it and a circle in the center. So it's really three circles. Uh, and this is a circle used specifically for initiations. And that's just a specific kind of circle that comes out of, you know, the Alexandrian Gardnerian paths. Then you have a circle over on the right, that's just a plain circle on the grass, and you can see the light being visualized there, and that's just their way of doing it. The last circle here is actually a triangle with a circle around it that's a snake eating its own tail. This is a common symbol used to bind um, fey or spirits or <laughs> demons. You bind them in a triangular shape because triangles are very strong, and that's what can keep them. You can also bind them to a mirror or a reflective surface. And um, the different shapes of the circles 
can help you bind different kinds of things. Um, you can have a triangle that um, is like a new member coming in because maybe it symbolizes them binding their energy into the coven. So maybe they start in a triangle and then you open a doorway and they come into the main circle and you close the doorway. Um, and like I said, you could put a separate triangle outside of your circle and then bind a demon into that circle that's not actually connected to yours. Maybe both of these circles are in a larger circle and they interface with each other, but they're not actually together. So you can ca cast really complicated circles depending on what you need. Um, the way to put this all together, okay, put the energy working all together. You're going to start by marking a large circle on the ground with chalk or strings or rocks, whatever, um, it doesn't need to be a physical marking, but doing the physical marking helps in the beginning, helps you to visualize the circle. Then you clear your mind and get to a state of mindlessness, which we've talked about now many times, and you, and you have breath control too. Uh, you walk the perimeter of the circle and you're just walking and you're just being, you're not thinking about anything else. You're not thinking, and then you just imagine a blue or purple or white light shooting out of your hand. Literally visualize it shooting out of your hand into the ground around you so it looks just like that glowing one in the picture here on the right. Uh, and then once the light comes all the way around the circle, uh, you're going to imagine it form all around you in just a large sphere dome like structure and now you're just completely f surrounded in your energy that you put out of you into the world and you imagine that nothing can get in or out of it. And then I want you to just stand in this energy and just breathe, okay? It's your energy. It's just like what we just did in that guided meditation where you're standing in your own light and the light is you and when you breathe the light breathes too. Inside the circle, your all of the vibrations should feel familiar, and you should notice that the vibrations inside the circle feel like higher vibrations, higher level energy than normal mundane energy. And you can even allow those higher vibrations to affect your mind and bring on an altered state of mind. That's called the ritual consciousness or the ritual awareness. And for most people, that is a choice, and you could come out of it at any time. So some further notes, uh, neither the markings nor the light on the outside of the circle create a physical divide, it's metaphysical only. So you're not going to be keeping out bullets, okay? I feel like that should be obvious. Um, but you would be keeping out any kind of negative energy. So someone inside the circle would not be able to shoot you. But, you know, someone outside could just shoot you right through it. If you leave or enter the circle unknowing even unknowingly you if it's not very firmly um, established it could cause it to dissipate or weaken until it dissipates uh, normally they'll cut a doorway of some form to allow people to go in and out um, i'll often cast my circles with a doorway by doorway we're talking a real doorway and they'll draw it in the air with their athame or with their hand and they'll imagine the light splitting you know, in some way. Uh, the circle is outside of space and time. So when you're in the circle, you're going to lose track of time. I go in circle and I'm like, oh, let's do a quick 30 minute ritual. And then it's like, it's three hours later. And like, I don't know what happened to my life. Okay. When you're in circle, you're outside of space and time. So you'll think a whole eternity's passed. It'll be five minutes or you'll be in there for four hours and be like wow that was nice like let's do it again and they'll be like oh my god it's fucking midnight <laughs> what um so bear that in mind and make sure you have ample time when you're going to enter circle now you have the concept of deosil versus widdershins deosil means going clockwise widdershins means going counterclockwise deosil is believed to be for summoning and conjuring widdershins is for um uh, the opposite for uh, banishing and uh, a lot of people think going Widdershins is bad luck and tell you to never go Widdershins even when you're taking the circle down you never go that way that's like Gardnerians would say that uh, I personally do Deosil to bring the circle and Widdershins to get rid of the circle uh, sometimes I just I'm feeling it and I just go Widdershins the whole time I don't really think it's that important honestly um, I think that it's cool when the people inside go one direction and the people outside go the other. That's the coolest. But um, yeah, it just depends on what you believe.
a lot of people have different opinions. So maybe just like put a comment on here about what you think and we'll talk about it. Okay, so that's the end of this lecture, um, how to cast a circle. Uh, this time we're going to get into some Gerald Gardner. Um, we're going to read uh, chapter three from Witchcraft Today. Um, in I know it's specific, chapter three, but it's I think that's the best one to start with. Gardner can be kind of hard to get through, so I just want to make sure it's really relevant if I'm making you read it. <laughs> uh, Living Wicca by Scott Cunningham. Many of you will have already read this. That's fine. You can reread it or not. It's up to you. I would read chapters one through three of Living Wicca. Now, this is not his first one. Wicca, which is the one most people have read and the one that I recommend to beginners all the time, most of the time on Reddit. So if you are on Reddit, yeah, I probably told you to read it. Um, but Living Wicca is actually his second one. So um, go ahead and read that one as well. Uh, and that will read chapters one through three. This will kind of give some perspective on working with energy and, and um, you know, so definitely check it out. Um, I would practice at least two of the meditations described in Liber Newell and above in the presentation. Do some of the beginner ones, okay? Do the mindless meditation. Do the motionless. Do the no thinking. Uh, do um, like the image one. Imagine like a square and imagine the square getting more and more complex as you zoom in over time. You know, make it the most complex square made of squares you've ever seen. Just like visualize it so strongly in your third eye and do it with your eyes open. Do that, you know, and visualize it. That is how you master magic right there. Just like learning to focus and, and visualize the most mundane of things, I'm telling you. So practice some of those beginner exercises, I'm telling you. And I would do it 30 minutes again. Um, you could do two, like 15 minutes, one and one, or you could do three, 10 minutes. I wouldn't do less than that or more sessions than that because 10 minutes is kind of the minimum for these these meditations I think but it's up to you uh, I want you to cast circle three times I don't care where you are or what you're doing try different things use a chalk outline one time plan it maybe do chalk an inside chalk do symbols like in the one like in the one picture here with the symbols like do something elaborate um, go to a giant field and just imagine the circle and shoot the light out or, or just dance around and imagine the the light being in your wake and maybe just dance around day so three times uh, and maybe sing a song or put on music, whatever. Um, and I want you to cast one indoors specifically and imagine it clinging to the walls of the room instead of the sphere because I want you to kind of be able to do um, a, a circle anywhere. So cast a circle three times this week and this will be easy for most of you. Um, but while you're in circle, I want you to also Read your self-dedication statement out loud. Read it like you would as if you were dedicating, even though you're not, and remember that you're not. Okay, just because you're saying the words in circles and you're, that you're dedicating. We're going to dedicate. For now, it's just practice. But like reread it, read it out loud, review my comments, think of any additional comments that you might have, or maybe email other people in the coven if you really want to. Um, and then I want you to just kind of like edit it and rewrite it a bit so that it feels right in the new space because ritual space is very different than mundane space. Now just to wrap this up, I would like to read for you all my um, statement. This is what I said. So this is an example of a second degree initiation statement. You guys are doing dedications and for my dedication it was something basic like um, you know I am rededicating myself to Wicca. I will serve the Lord and Lady in love and life in perfect love and perfect trust for the rest of my days so mode it be. Something like that. Basic. Okay. Some people will rhyme. Some people it's poetic. Um, for some people it's there's more words. I just also want to give um, an example of my second degree initiation to show kind of the progress from me doing that very basic dedication to me taking on a patron goddess and becoming a daughter, of, you know, a daughter, a priestess um, of an actual goddess. So I said, I, I aspected the goddess Ninlil, and while she was in circle with me, I said to her, 
Uh, well, she first said it to me, and I repeated it to her. But it, it goes, Tehillah, being of independence and strength, of change and of spirit, you stand bare before me, goddess Ninlil, feminine strength, winds, lady of the southern winds, I am she, mother of gods, goddess of rebirth, Inanna, Isis, mighty Ishtar, goddess of fertility, love, and war, bringer of beginnings. Do you swear to me to uphold your witch's reed and to always serve the divine, me and my kin, in perfect love and perfect trust, in love and light for all of time? And then I said, you know, I, sw I swear to you, Ninlil, and then I repeated it. And then she said to me, blessed be daughter of the southern winds. And I said, blessed be. Right? Because in ritual, you always repeat, blessed be, and some mode of be. Whenever anyone says it, you repeat it. Just like, amen. So, um, this one has a lot of God in it. A lot of goddess. Okay? Because a second degree usually has patrons in Wicca. Usually a second degree becomes, um, you know, a, a witch of a certain page of a certain god or goddess in Wicca. Um, that you don't have to do that if, if you don't believe in the gods and you don't want to do that. You don't have to. Um, but if you do, then you'll find that, you know, when you speak your second degree oaths, you'll have a lot of this kind of stuff as well. But the thing that I wanted you to take away from this is not the deity. I wanted you to take away the repetitious nature, the saying things multiple ways, the poetry, and the fact that it just flows out and it feels very natural. That's what you want it to be. Something that if you messed up the wording a little bit, it doesn't matter because it flows naturally and it just fits you. It fits the atmosphere, you know. So I want you to think about that and cast circle and really consider these dedications. This is the top priority. If you want to send me your dedication like before the weekend so we can review it over the weekend, that'd be even better because you need to have it finalized. If you're going to do this course properly, you need to have it finalized so that you can actually uh, cast circle and invoke deity uh, if you so choose to and speak your dedication um, on the first. And we can actually do it at the same time and link our circles if people are interested in that. Okay, so that is lecture number two. I hope you guys like it. If you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment um, or send me an email, and I'll answer them as soon as I can. All right. Have a nice week, everyone. Blessed be.